I was always a painter and really it was um, in the late 60s, 70, that um, I felt that one was um, lacking uh, something that, that mattered a lot, which was the sound. And so, in a sense, I suppose, that brought about a change in the actual way I was working. Mm. And so, in a sense, one can look at something like Dresden Dynamo, where uh, the actual film was made without a camera, it was handmade. So it's very curiously in between the two. And what I wanted to do was in a way do something very different from maybe conventional filmmaking where the sound could not be artificed separately from the image so that whatever the image was the sound would be exactly that mm -hmm. so by doing it by hand there's something on the side of a 16 mil film called the optical soundtrack so I could actually place the image straight over onto the soundtrack. So the one is the other, there's mm -hmm. no separation between. So in a sense that how it was rather how I started. But of course at that time a uh, film was not quite seen as art. Oh, there was a, a hesitation there that it wasn't quite what it should be. So, in a sense, that became very interesting in relationship to teaching because it was the beginning of um, sections of an art school that changed name almost every three years. But, to me, it was a, a wonderful thing because it brought together students who were doing sound, writing, uh, painting together and I found that extremely refreshing where one is not categorically separating different activities one's actually allowing them to come together and so in a sense I think that underlies a lot of how I work which is a very much across spectrums of categories rather than within a single category. So yes, I do write and I write sometimes quite, one might call it factually, but it might be fiction, you never quite know. Truth is rather hard to hold on to. And sometimes it's quite deliberately uh, poetic in the sense of the conciseness of poetry, which I find extremely um, engaging. And I think, in a sense, I could say some of my major influences are from reading women's writing, um, because, in a sense, that has not been excluded from being published in the same way as they've been wiped out in philosophy, mathematics, fine art and so on, and composing, of course, which leads on to like music. Um, in a sense, it relates very closely to um, Running Light, which is another film that is being screened here, which uh, we started making the sound recordings for in 1985, Mary Pat, an American uh, filmmaker and artist, and I uh, were actually researching the state of drinking water in Virginia, West Virginia, uh, because of the open cast um, coal mining. And we met someone called Pope Barford, who was very helpful, and we talked about that for a moment. And then he said, well, actually, there are other problems here, those of migrant workers, migrant agricultural workers. And he said, you're going to Johnson County. There are many migrant camps there. And 
that's really how Running Light began. And we didn't take very many photographs. It felt um, very intrusive in a sense, I think one felt. Yeah. And what we did do, though, was make um, sound recordings. And I think both of us were so shocked by conditions. Uh, the, th the system was of um, white farmers who were armed and migrant workers uh, moving up and down the coast coming from the south to the north. And I think Mary Pat found it very difficult. I had to do something ASAP um, so she could testify that that was a, a way of, uh, that that was valid. So that's how Running Light came to be made. And in a sense, it shouldn't be read as a visual documentary. It was not that. Um, it is, in a sense, much more a play, a constructed play where the chairs indicate various levels of power and conflict and questioning and answering. Um, so it should not be read as a document at all. Anyway, that emerged and in a sense, I suppose, ambiguous journeys was definitely related to that, but probably came about slightly differently in the sense that it was much more deliberate uh, in that I wanted to look at why this was happening. It wasn't so much, again, a documentary of it happening, but why was it uh, unavoidable? And in a way that leads one to a, an analysis of neoliberal economics that almost ensure that it's going to happen. And what it does is provide a very cheap workforce you're holding people in semi-debt. If they've got no papers, they're illegal, whatever that means. And who defines an illegal person, I think is the question that um, we made a small pamphlet about and do have one. If one is coming from a different perspective, it is liable to be seen as not political, as natural. There is a sidelining of rather right-wing opinion at the moment that I think is not seen properly as political. We all are political. You couldn't not be. It doesn't take an artist to be that or a politician. Um, and I think we should be careful. I think language is used very deceptively and very calculatedly. Um, and this might take us back to light reading right at 1978. So again, there are sort of connections that I guess run through my work. Um, and that certainly is one of them. The um, difficulty of language and how grammar actually affects the construction of a sentence, and a sentence has to do with society and how society is put together. So I think there's some very difficult things, and this might bring me back to one of my rather favorite authors, Gertrude Stein, who is a wonder at breaking up grammatical, um, accepted, and so on and so forth, um, definitely. I think she should be more well known. In a, in a sense, and it's quite an interesting change, is that after all, light music started in a gallery, not in a cinema. So I've sort of moved a bit between the one and the other, um, because expanded cinema um, I was certainly involved in, and that often led to a sound piece being performative. So uh, we may be, uh, one we did, um, I worked with a colleague, um, we actually edited the film 
in the gallery. We simply exchanged parts of the film. It was a soundtrack. Uh, Cornelius Cardew had composed a very short piece for us, which we actually uh, edited, and so one got different arrangements of the piece that he'd actually written, which was very tolerant of him to allow this to be done. So we recomposed it, and that lasted about nine hours. We just exchanged parts of the film. Another one we did, we actually uh, ran two very long hundred foot loops in the ICA. And one was a uh, clear leader and one was a uh, black leader. And one of us, and I can't remember which of us, uh, used a chalk to uh, darken the clear leader and the other used the razor to scrape off the black. And so the thing started silent. And then as we worked on it, it got noisier and noisier and noisier because the optical track was getting written on and scraped away. And what we did, we stopped the projectors every now and again. And in those days, this was 1970-something, uh, we stopped it and ran the uh, film strip through a Xerox machine. And so one was actually putting the score on the wall after the sound had been composed. So it was all back to front, as it were. So that was, um, so one's moved a bit between um, cinema, mm. which is absolutely true, and galleries. But this is the first time that one has been involved completely in the gallery in this sense. and. I think it's fairly new for, for galleries, perhaps, to run this sort of work. Um, and I come back to thanking Nottingham Contemporary for doing something that I think is quite uh, new, really.